Right. Are we there? Good. Good evening, everyone. Um, I welcome you to um, a new resilience lecture at the Center for Historic Houses. Thank you very much for coming, for being here. And it has been a really exciting journey so far. We started the lecture series during the lockdown on the 3rd of July. And it was a wonderful opportunity for people to visit from all over the world while they were in lockdown. Currently, lockdown has been introduced or reintroduced again in some parts of the world, such as in Germany and in the UK. So I really hope that you will enjoy this, um, this lecture. And it's basically, again, another trip to, um, um, to a faraway place. And um, it has done more than that. It was more than just a place that we can visit. We learned a lot during the lecture series. And um, something we learned is really about the contribution that people made. Of course, a lecture series is called resilience. And I think resilience is the concept that is so much needed today. And resilience is also the theme that is so characteristic for the historic houses of, of India, because they survived extreme climates. They survived war and all sorts of problems, and they're still there. And I'm simply amazed and also really inspired by the people who live in these houses and fill them with life, sometimes from a total bringing them back to life, where other people would give up, but they didn't. Every single one that I'm inviting here is someone who is resilient, who has done the impossible and revived and, and breathes in meaning for us today into the buildings. So last time we had um, Meranga Fort, which is an example of fantastic museum management in India, really one of the best examples. Um, today we have a historic house in Kolkata, which is managed as a hotel and uh, actually by a Punjabi in Bengal, I hear, which is uh, very <laughs> interesting for me to hear. And it's really lovely because of course, with a digital format that we are having, um, we are able to connect people from different places, but you also see that someone from Punjab, of course, can also be in Bengal. And I'd love to hear more about your journey, your entrepreneurial spirit, your vision for the house, what you've done. And we start with a little video um, about the place so that we get a better idea. Yes, please, Archie, let's start. Is it visible? Yes. Ore chelen dile, ore chelen dile, shodari gouri atmo pabon. It is one of the most iconic film buildings of this area, and it was uh, built about uh, more than 250 years before. Well, restoration is a very important aspect of conservation of our heritage because if uh, any edifice is not restored, it will fall to pieces. So it's imperative that restoration as a process is given due importance. <laughs> ঐতিহ্যটা বাড়িটার এমনি একটা ইম্পর্টেন্স আছে এই বাড়িটার যে আকৃতি যেভাবে এটা তো একটা বিরল এই আশপাশে কোথাও পাওয়া যাবে না সে তাছাড়া বাঙালির মানুষের এই বাড়ির সঙ্গে অনেক স্মৃতি জড়িয়ে আছে I was very impressed by the beauty of the place and the majesty of the proportions and, and the surroundings are just fantastic. <laughs> 
خاطر مانو بی جانم بیه چوری اون مانو بی جانم اون مانو بی جانم چوله دل تیجت دیشی لی باری تیجت دیشی ایتا راج باری دیشی به نام چوله راج باری دیشی بی شکل تلاش پولی چی تو هی جات سی Thank you very much. Um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit how you ended up doing what you were doing and how did you discover the house and what was the journey? Well, uh, the, the way these things happen is normally purely, some of the best things that happen to you in life are purely by chance. And uh, I discovered the Rajbadi in 2008 uh, when I was uh, looking for land to set up a textile factory, which is my core business. And I heard about the Rajbadi and I uh, heard about temples near it. There are some beautiful Krishna temples in the area that were in an Angkor Vat-like stage. And I came to see them and then uh, walked in through a little door and fell in completely in love with this place that had banyan trees growing out of every crevice, but was uh, something so beautiful uh, that it stole my heart away. And I decided to invest uh, the time, more importantly than the money, in acquiring the place. And I bought it from 18 owners who uh, had a huge trust deficit and didn't talk to each other. So that took me two years and spent another seven years on the restoration. Uh, the video that you just saw shows a bit of the journey there. I think that uh, uh, resilience, as you said, stems from caring. And when you, when you care, then you dare, if I may. And I was so deeply in love with the place that it, it fueled my passion and my journey and, and, and kept that journey alive. So today we have a 30 room, 350 uh, year old heritage hotel on a four acre site with two ponds that has received awards from Intac, uh, in fact, two awards from Intac for the restoration and has been lauded by Condé Nast Traveler UK as uh, the top 50 hidden destinations in the world and the only one they picked in India for that year. And it's been a, it's been a great journey for me. Wonderful. You see, what you say is, um, you know, we see that suddenly this building is there and is alive. But as you say, starting is so hard. And what is behind the scenes is so difficult when a lot of people actually give up. So once you want to, you have the idea, you have the passion, you want to go ahead, but then you see you can't really do it because there's several owners. How do you do this? They don't talk to each other. How do you actually get the contract? You know, so how did you do this in this kind of, you know, in the two years and so on? What was happening? What made you actually succeed? I think tenacity. Handling any delicacy is important in handling the styling of a project. I think tenacity and, and giving it your all is very important. I think that when I set on this journey, I had set my heart on the place and I knew that there was no way. My primary motive was not commerce. My primary motive was to preserve this beautiful, grand old uh, lady, if I may call her. <laughs> and, and, and it was my job to make sure that she didn't crumble and fall to bits. And I wanted to make sure that I gave her back her place in the world. 
So one thing then was then you got the contract, you started the work. How did you find the right people um, who had the knowledge and the expertise to do the kind of conservation work that was necessary? So I, uh, a little while back, I think you saw Mr. GM Kapoor on the, of Intac on the, uh, on, on one of the videos. I reached out to Intac because that was the one organization that I had heard was uh, uh, knowledgeable, if I may, on, on restoration. And then I also reached out to, I don't know if you know Ratish Nanda of the Aga Khan Foundation. They've, yeah, uh, yes, they've, yes. they've worked on Humayun's tomb and several yes, other very yeah. interesting projects. And I called Ritish and I said, you know, here I am. I'm in love with the place. And I don't want to mess it up by using cement. And I don't know how to go about this whole business of lime mortar. So he sent me a couple of books, which is really nice. And then he said, you know what? Right in your backyard is Murshidabad, which has the best masons possibly in the country. So send me a dozen of them and I'll train them. And uh, I sent him a dozen masons from here. They worked with the Aga Khan Foundation, trained on the techniques, came back and we set up on our journey. Uh, so you have to ask questions. You know, you have to be, you have to not be scared to say you don't know and you have to seek out people who have knowledge. Excellent. So this took about seven years, the restoration process. The journey took seven years. Yeah, okay. <laughs> seven, seven, seven long, but very beautiful years. <laughs> right. And then how about um, your vision for the interiors and what kind of a place did you actually want to have? What was the atmosphere, the spirit? Uh, what did you want to do? So when I found the Rajbari, as I said, it had banyan trees growing out of possibly out of every crevice. And, and it was important for me at that stage to uh, retain what I loved it for which is why when you see the photographs uh, if i may ask yes, they're ready to, to be shared we can share them now would you please uh, of yes. the main building uh, just a moment please uh, shatter visha um, yeah I'll, I'll do it right away okay are you um, are you able to screen share do i need to yes i am uh, one of the co-hosts right. right yeah so if we can look at some of the photographs of how And by the way, currently, while you are talking, you are actually in situ. You are actually there, right? This is the I, background. So we are really talking currently with you being there. Right. And I, I, I live here now at the Rajbari and I enjoy every minute of it. And I'm so glad I spent the time that I did to, uh, to do what I have done. So if we can move to the next slide. So this was the general... Uh, uh, look, so if you see that, that's the main building as I as I first found it. And if you look at it, you'll see that uh, most of the woodwork had been worn away. There were trees growing out of everywhere. If we move to the next slide, I know that there's one. Uh, these, interestingly, were the wooden shutters that were on the Zanana side of the building. And some of them I've been able to retain. Uh, can we go, move to the next one, please? So there you see the main corridors on the first floor of the building. All the woodwork had gone away. The, uh, the roof was in a near state of collapse. And if we go to the next. And the next. So this uh, huge crater on the roof is actually the room I'm currently sitting in. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, I, I think when we go along, we'll see photographs of the finished dining room. Maybe we can skip through the rest of these, uh, maybe a few seconds at a time. So that was how I first saw the Rajbari. And I walked in through a little three foot door and just didn't know that I was going to see such a beautiful edifice. And the next one, please. Right. And from here, can we now take a look at uh, some of the slides of the Rajbari once it's complete? And the next, please. Can we just move through this? Are we doing two at a time? Yeah. Can we hold that? Can we go back, please, to the shot of... So the temple that you see in the lower down uh, slide 
is what I was told about the Krishna temples. And I, I, I was told they were beautiful and indeed they are. And as a matter of fact, we are currently uh, working in the village to try and restore them as we best can. And the same Rajbadi that was once falling down now hosts beautiful cultural performances on the, uh, on, on the majestic steps that lead up to the Thakur Dalan. Can we move to the next? And so just a question, when you found it, it was absolutely deserted or were there any residents at the there, time? There was a gentleman who lived here with uh, a family that was once part of his serving retinue, but they had ceased to serve him but continued to occupy the place, which was also one of the thorns in my side because while they had no legal right, I was, uh, it was very difficult for me to ask them to leave and get them to leave really. So that was, it was almost like negotiating with another set of owners. Although in fact they were ranked trespassers. And the next, I think that slide shows a little bit of the food that we have. And, and if we go to the next one, there's, yeah, so that will give you a, 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 is there one of the bedrooms in one of the swimming pool? I think I sent you uh, some photographs. Not, not actually. I have actually downloaded all the images that you've sent. It didn't have. In fact, okay, so maybe, you have a bed maybe, maybe with two go. beds. Is this the one? With the white bed? The four yeah, so you were bed? talking about the interiors. That's mm -hmm. why I wanted to go back to yes. that. And <coughs> I beg your pardon. Shata, yeah, I can, know, this one yeah. image with the, with the four poster beds, is this maybe the one um, he's referring to? Oh, stop chair. Yes. So I remember the one slide with the four poster bed. Right. Yeah. So what, in terms of interiors, I decided to be, I actually discussed with a lot of people, you know, I had, I had conversations with several people and I, I uh, uh, met a very interesting architect from uh, Sri Lanka who was following in the footsteps of Jeffrey Bawa. Yes. Called Channa Daswati. I don't know if you know Channa. Uh, very well respected. Uh, and Channa came here in, in the beginning of my journey and we sat around on red plastic chairs and talked about what we should do. And a couple of months later, he called. to the bride and groom and a vote of thanks to me for hosting them. And I don't remember the gentleman's name, but also a, a, a very well-known architect. He says, Channa, I have bad news for you. I've been telling Ajay that he doesn't need an architect. All he needs to do is honestly follow in the footstep of the man who designed this building 300 years ago. And I tell you, that is possibly the truth of all restoration projects, that if you stay true to the form for which it was designed for and don't monkey around with it, you will walk the best line that you could I ever I agree. Walk. This is really nice. And I think this is one of the reasons that attracts me so much to historic buildings, because somehow it's not the ego of the person who creates, but it's actually stepping back and listening to history, listening to what was there before you. So what do you know about the history of this building, the family who lived there? Did you do some research? Were you able to do some detective work there? I, as you can imagine, was intrigued and I, I very much played the, played the path of Sherlock in trying to find uh, what, what the family was all about. And to my surprise, I learned that they had land grants that went back to the time of Akbar. And there was, so one of the original family members was a lieutenant in Man Singh's army and for services to the, to the emperor was given land grants in far off Bengal back in the day we have a district called the 24 Parganas. The 24 Parganas was not just the largest district in Bengal, but was also the largest district in India. So these uh, zamindars or landlords were the revenue collectors for the largest, one of the largest districts in this part of the country. And uh, 
I think over the years, they lived a good life. They built temples. There is, there's a street in Calcutta named after the family. Uh, but there were changes. And you were talking about, you were talking about the vagaries of time and politics and, and nature. And they fell, they fell foul of all those. So I think by the time independence rolled around, they were already in a state of near bankruptcy. And by the time I found them, there was a 91-year-old man who lived here. The rest of the family had moved out. And, uh, and they, things were financially quite difficult for them, really. Um, yeah. So uh, the architecture of Kolkata is so closely connected to the British Raj, you know, all this kind of again, neoclassical architecture, the neoclassical influence and so on. What do you know about this period from, from the time of the British Raj? And what, was there, what kind of an encounter was there between um, the local Indians and, and the Europeans who were there at the time? So, you know, I think, I, I think the encounter was, of course, related to two things. One was power and the other was money. And I think they're both interlinked in some form uh, as, as we go along. And uh, which is why back in the day when Murshidabad was the financial capital of India, there were so many stately homes that were built in a European fashion so that when... when uh, when people who were the company Bahadur, as it was called, would visit, they would feel at ease and feel that they were talking to somebody who understood it and got their culture. I think there was a, you know, there was a fair amount of trade in Indigo, and that was a part of it. But it was, it was largely the financial dealings of uh, people who were supporting the East India Company, who then built themselves into the fabric and built homes that would make Europeans feel comfortable. And it is interesting to note that actually the Europeans were there on a temporary basis and they kind of saved the money up to bring that back home and buy their kind of country estate and so on. So actually the Indian owned houses were much more spectacular in a way or were much more... Of course, of course. Um, we have, um, you know, this uh, uh, photograph here of the bedroom. Is this the one that you were referring to earlier? Because we are talking about the interiors and we talked about... Right. So, so Bengal is famous. Uh, uh, Bengal is famous for its uh, four-poster beds and the Mohargari beds, uh, which you see here. And, uh, and also, Bengal was, was very famous for... Uh, these high beds which were kept in, uh, in stately homes so that back in the day, if there was anything that was on the ground, uh, anything reptilian, I would say insect-like, not reptilian, there would be enough gap between the floor. And so they built high beds. They actually had stairs to some of these beds, little wooden stairs that you would climb up to. I had a really difficult time uh, finding some of these beds because uh, I was determined not to use reproductions. So what you're seeing here is typically uh, what, what back in the day would be used by rich landlords in their homes. And these are beds are not reproductions, but they're actually uh, uh, beds that I've found from different dealers. Wow, so from what time do they date, these, uh, these beds? I, I think Probably the oldest bed that I have would be about 200 years old. And a lot of them are 150, 125 year old beds. Interesting. So we, we need to talk again about you know, where do you find these uh, pieces and so on. You see, there is sure. of course, a correlation between um, the development of furniture in Europe and in Asia, because originally furniture, particularly beds, were very high. In the Middle Ages, you had what was called a trundle bed, something under the bed that you would pull out. So it's actually really practical and uh, it saves also space. So it has been oh, actually revived in contemporary kind of design practice. And it was also associated with status, whatever was higher was, you know, kind of expressed status. And also because in Europe it was very cold. So you didn't really want to be too close to the floor. Um, so this is interesting that in India you also have that, but for you know different reasons. But um, 
um, you know, of course, even, you know, if you think about the development of the chair, it came from the throne, even in Europe as well. And it was high. So there was always this kind of um, association with status um, and, and height of furniture. Um, it's so interesting oh. that you say Moshidabad is nearby. I don't know how far is that from you, Moshidabad? It's a, it's a five hour drive. A five hour, okay, I thought it was closer, yes. No, no. Um, the question is always, um, how do you revive these historic buildings? What do you do? Of course, hotels is one example. Um, it uh, creates a, a revenue stream. It fills it also with life. Sometimes people keep both a hotel and they want to have a, a small exhibition space or muse museum space. This is something I see more and more because people mm -hmm. love history and they really want to um, kind of uh, showcase this. Um, so how do you feel with other historic buildings in the vicinity? Is there an exchange? Do you collaborate with others? Uh, because I know that especially in Kolkata, you have a very, very active group of citizen-driven heritage activists, um, in, which is really nice to see. So how is this? Is, are you just this kind of lone wolf doing this on your own? Or um, you already mentioned there's Intak and there was a lot of support there. So how would you see this kind of um, yourself and other heritage organizations or people who own and manage historic sites? You know, you're right. There is a great uh, amount of interest and there are lots of very good people who are uh, supportive of uh, restoration and interested in restoration. Calcutta has always been, if I may use the word, a kind of mecca for culture and, and, and arts. And uh, I think that the challenge that they face is not so much on how to go about it, but because of the legal process and the fragmentation of ownership, it becomes very close to impossible to even for owners in a property to come together and jointly improve or develop it. So the challenge really for most people in this part of the country is because of the, because of the tenancy laws in Bengal in the past, what happened was that uh, the law essentially stated that a, even a trespasser cannot be evicted without due process of law. And as we know that uh, the process of law can really be very long in, in India and thereby it has uh, led to a stage where people even in their lifetime and sometimes in two lifetimes cannot evict tenants who are occupying spaces and, uh, and therefore it becomes a really horrific task. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the the Center for Historic Houses that I established uh, last year in October 2019 is the first institution of its kind in India to represent um, the privately owned historic houses of India. Normally in other countries, in Western countries, you have such historic houses associations and they're really very helpful um, to have an, you know, about exchange of ideas, to offer support, to do lobby work and so on. So I really uh, want to suggest this to you. You know, we are doing a number of really interesting initiatives because I find so many people do great things, but only a small number of people know about it. If you have a centralized platform, it's much easier to exchange ideas. Also, we also we are thinking about introducing an online collection, a heritage collection, uh, where the different owners can actually, um, you know, uh, have their collection. And so it can be sold and can be purchased from all over India, uh, which will be really nice, especially now during the coronavirus, we are planning a, a roundtable discussion to think about um, non-visitor related business ideas, um, because a lot of people, of course, have really suffered um, you know, during this um, pandemic. Yes, of course. Yeah. So we are thinking about, um, you know, having a collection, especially people do a lot of gardening or, you know, like masalas, uh, something for the kitchen and garden accessories and so on. This is something we are currently thinking about. I'd love to know from you, um, how do people actually respond? Um, because this is such a labor of love and, um, you know, it has... Um, so much uh, character and atmosphere in comparison to how most people live, you know, which is very pragmatic and the way buildings are built these days, you know, they all look the same. It's a box, it's a lot of concrete and so on. 
So how do you think this experience changes people or has an impact on people? What is the response of people? I'd love to know that. So I think in one word positive, and if I was to go, if I was to go beyond the, the response where they're actually, for most Bengalis who visit, and I've, I've got to say this, for most Bengalis who visit, I'm, I'm humbled because many of them walk up to me and thank me for saving this part of their heritage. And, and I, I actually feel quite awkward and embarrassed when people say that to me. And sometimes they'll turn around and tell me, you being a non-Bengali have done this and we thank you for it. And I always tell them, you know, I'm a third generation uh, Punjabi and I'm as much Bengali as, as, the, as the next one. So I get, I get the feeling that when people walk into a place that has the kind of historic uh, uh, visual significance and that's backed with a with the cultural sensitivity that I think we've managed to achieve, I think it takes them to a really nice place in their hearts and minds. I agree. This is wonderful. So do you have already a kind of relationship with clients, some cli um, cu customers who come regularly or um, uh, who are the, pe and who are the people who come and stay there? I'd like to know. Yeah. So pre, pre, uh, Pre-COVID and lockdown, of course, we had visitors from all over the world. And now, for the moment, and I'm really delighted that this is happening, is that most Calcuttans who were reasonably well healed would be traveling overseas for their holidays. They wanted to get out of Calcutta. And because that option no longer exists and there's a paradigm shift in travel, Many of those who probably hadn't headed out to us because they were busy going to Europe or the US or the Southeast have now started coming to us. And, and it's quite delightful both for us and for them to have them over. And what are the kind of strategies you, um, you employed to, um, in the time of the pandemic? What are the kind of business and principles you used? So, so well, during the pandemic, we were, we were closed. And because we live on the estate, it was, uh, it was a ni nicer place to be. Our problem was not the pandemic. Our problem was we got hit by a hurricane, Amphan. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, when you live in the city, I, I don't think you realize the impact that something like that can have in the village. It was, it was horrific. Mm. There were hundreds of homes in the village. We're not too far from the Sundarbans. Uh, there were hundreds of homes in the village where people had no roofs on their head. There was, I lived without electricity for three weeks. Oh. Uh, the only generator we had on the estate, 250 kVA generator. And it used, to guzzle, it used to guzzle oil so we could only afford to run it for three hours in a day. And then we started giving electricity into the village. Uh, we also reached out to friends and family uh, to work with us and we rebuilt 60 homes in the village, almost from scratch up. And I can tell you that while the government was doing what it can, but the process was slow and that was a really tough time. With that, what happened was we made some lasting relationships, which I tell you in some ways I didn't forge in the 10 years that I've been here. So now we are working on on, on several interesting projects in the village. And one of them is, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, my, my uh, uh, core business is textiles. And now we've set up a, a center to train women in the village to sew uh, natural jute and cotton bags. Ooh. And we're going to find a way to take them to market. Wonderful. So the Center for Historic Houses would love to support this initiative, for example. That would be lovely. I'll, I'll, I'll be in touch with you and tell you more about what we're doing there. Wonderful. Um, and did you also have, let's say, extended stays? A number of the hotels offered um, discounts for, let's say, stay vacations and so on, where people stayed for a week, two weeks, or even a month? So I, during, the, during the, the, the early days of the lockdown or during the lockdown, I didn't want to do that because in the village, people are very sensitive to outsiders coming in. Mm -hmm. So even if we needed supplies from the city, I would tell the car bringing it in 
to drop it off at a point where somebody from the Rajbari would go and pick it up because there was a, a, a fear psychosis in people's mind that if people come from outside, they'll bring, uh, bring the virus with them. Yeah, the so same was in my village because I have a small farmhouse with 15 dogs and, you know, people delivered vegetables and then the villagers were throwing stones at them and so on. So, yeah. Yeah. Where, where is this, if I may ask? This is I in, about it. Part, in Haryana. I see. Okay. <laughs> so, we didn't have any of those and then, so we have a lot of weekend stays and we have people coming now uh, during the week as well because they think that the occupancy is going to be lower. And, uh, and they want some space for themselves. And we, we are fairly well laid out because we have clusters of four rooms together, three rooms together. And, and people find that they have their own space, which is nice. We are currently collaborating with a number of really fantastic um, historic house projects in Odisha. Um, so, such as Bilgaria Palace and um, Denkanal Palace, for example. And I'm um, and I would like to put you in touch with them as well because they do a number of really exciting uh, projects in the field of social entrepreneurship, uh, talking to the tribal people and um, asking the tourists who come to stay to be actually mini investors in their particular goods. And uh, we are trying to create a collection now with beautiful baskets and you know other things that could be used for the garden and the home. Um, and it's very inspiring to see because craftspeople, of course, they had no work because often they sold their goods, you know, in front of the temple or at weddings. And of course, there were no gatherings. So um, this was a real problem. So there are, um, you know, it's really nice of these historic houses to support the crafts initiatives. And as you yes. are doing now with the women, for instance, in, in the village, uh, that's really lovely. So basically, you also see from um, uh, when you started. So when did the hotel open again? When was this? So we've, we've been, uh, our doors have been open for the last three months, I think now. But, but, but when did you first open, I mean, the hotel? We first opened four years ago. Four this years ago. This is our fourth year okay. running, yeah. So, um, over these four years, I mean, even now from talking to you, I see things are already changing because of the experience even of this um, you know, cat catastrophe. You wanted to change course. You're seeing a, a new additional aspect to what it is, how you want to interpret the house and use the house. C could you tell us a little bit about starting it, um, be, becoming an entrepreneur in the hospitality sector, being um, a heritage manager in a way? What have you learned? What were the mistakes? What can you share with others? And, and what is the biggest insight, so to, so to say, you learned? So I've always been very aesthetically uh, oriented. You know, my orientation is always running towards aesthetics. I did learn that while aesthetics are important, operations are equally important. And whenever you work on, on a project, you have to bear in mind that you have to have a very judicious mix of the aesthetics that you want to achieve because places like this are largely about aesthetics. And then you have to plan for your operations and bring both things together smoothly so that they don't jar. So I would, I would say that one, one piece of advice I would give anybody who starts this journey is please, when you're working on something like this, just as important as, as the aesthetics are, please do talk to someone who's operationally sound so that you're, you're ready to receive when you're ready to receive guests or do whatever you want to do with your place, you have the right infrastructure in place. Right. And um, how do you build up this infrastructure? Because especially starting in a village, there's nothing there. And there are so many obstacles. You know, every, every time you do something great, you encounter, you know, it's like you cut off the head of a, of a snake and two more are growing. So how do, you, how do you do this? Because I see this even in the village. I came with all of this enthusiasm and every step has a major drawback. Hmm? I, I, I understand what you're saying. Okay. Put the same. And it's taken, it's taken me 12 years now and still sometimes I'm considered an outsider. But <laughs> uh, I think one of, one, when I say operationally strong, also one, one of the most important things, especially in the business that we're in, is uh, you must hire low. You must, sorry, I couldn't hear you. You must hire? 
you must believe in your people around you. Yeah. You must locally. Yes. You must train them. You must make them a part of your home and your family. Yes. I saw that too and I found that really inspiring because Just build those threads. We're also grateful for the opportunity. In one case, one person said, but I don't speak English. And she said, you can learn it. And he did. And she gave him this job and he did such a great job. So it's really nice to empower people and give them this opportunity for growth. Yes. yes um, another thing that yeah. I've been thinking and a lot of people are doing in the also being very conscious about sustainability is I'd love to grow my own vegetables and, and um, organic vegetables. How do you have enough land? Is this something that would interest you um, so that actually everything you serve in the, um, in the hotel would be homegrown? I think it's, it's a great way forward. I think it's a great way forward. We have a we have a we have a small vegetable patch, and as a matter of fact, I have acquired five acres of land close by, and that is the direction that we're heading in. Fantastic! So you really see, although you don't know the other people that we are in touch with, you're all thinking the same thing at the same time. So it really means there's something there. There's a real connection. I think. As 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 a matter of. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt you. As a matter of fact, uh, both the families you mentioned in Orissa, I, I, I know reasonably well. Oh. Uh, Mrinalik, Mrinalika and Akshita went to yes. uh, were good friends of my daughter and uh, Amar Jyoti Singh, you and I were in school together at Mayo. <laughs> Fantastic. So, yeah, I know both the families. Yeah, so kind of it's about. a small circle, right? Everyone knows each yes. other. Yeah. yeah. But I also think it is the people who work with heritage and historic houses, they're different because they care. They care about these historic buildings. They bring them back to life and take themselves not so seriously in, in, in this. And it's this True. kind of the willingness to serve, <coughs> serve others and to know that they were, you are there because other people before you did this and achieved this. You are in this kind of chain of, of de generations. That is a very humbling um, kind of um, um, experience. And um, with a historic building, having the sensitivity for the beauty, for the materials, and also doing the research, doing the detective work, all of this um, makes you very conscious. And I think every single one that I met who is in this business of historic houses has this kind of sen sensitivity. And um, this is really, really lovely and inspiring to see and very nice for people. And a little bit crazy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because as you say, you know, normal, normal people just give up. <laughs> the heritage people don't give up. This is the amazing thing. And I don't know where it comes from. They just keep going because in their head, it's so clear where they're going. Because once you have yeah. a goal, even if you don't achieve it, you're still walking towards it. And, that will, and you will move, you know, you will move on this way then, which is really good. True. <laughs> True. Um, let me look at some of these um, uh, questions that we have here. So, um, yes, we have a lovely message here also from Naomi Kaligaro, who is... Um, a regular and I think this is the touching aspect of the uh, of the lecture series we've really built a community of people who have somehow a connection with these historic houses and Naomi has a, fa a fascinating connection family connection with in England now and is especially interested in Tagore and uh, so we really want to do one lecture with the, <laughs> with the Tagore house this is something we are planning um, yes, and I'm just reading it to you so that you hear it. Um, so fascinating, exciting, impressive. I feel very in tune with the speaker. Um, missed the first part. I thank you too deeply as my family were in Kolkata for generations and Kolkata fascinates me. Um, Minal is there, <laughs> lovely. <laughs> yes, Minal is also there again, a regular and of course, the, it's, it's, it, we really love what, what you are doing, Minal and everyone. It's so lovely that you also know each other. Uh, and you know, there's a question about the type of wood that is used. Yeah, this is really very interesting for me as well. So these beds, for instance, what kind of wood uh, was used for these beds? So for the beds, it was mostly mahogany, even back in the it lent itself easier to turn. I mentioned here that while we're talking about material, that almost 100% of the material that I've used at the Rajbadi is recycled and upcycled. 
Yeah. I I I bought old Burma teak sleeper wood uh, from railway. I I uh, I bought bricks from houses that were being broken down. I bought marble and cast iron. I love old cast iron. I simply love old cast iron. And I don't know if I can flip yes, my I was camera. Wondering, is it possible that you can lead us a little bit through the house? And or are you uh, <laughs> stuck in one place? With great, with great pleasure, I, 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 I'd be happy to do that. Yes. I, let oh, me fantastic. see if I can turn well, my camera really around. Uh, how do I turn my camera around? Is what I'm. Ah, there it is. So that is. Uh, this is our private dining room. Lovely, beautiful, here. and and the prints that you see at the back are Raja Ravi Verma's from Raja Ravi Verma's press. Oh. I can't afford his original artwork, yeah. of course, but there you go. <laughs> Wonderful. And as you see, we've so this this seats twelve people. <sighs> And then I'm going to step out to Now this is a real treat now having this virtual tour. Absolutely amazing. Oh. <laughs> I mean the light in the atmosphere is just unbelievable. Yeah. It's and that so down there is our library and I'm going to go down the steps and while I'm walking down, maybe. And so here I see you didn't want to put plaster on these columns. No, no, not at all. So to really have a great feel of authenticity and patina. Yeah. And those sunbursts are so beautiful in the day with the bougainvillea growing on it. Oh. Lovely. So this is the central courtyard. And, and, and the wing that we're looking at here, in fact, I was mentioning to you that this used to be the Zanana section. And yeah. one of the things about it was they always had uh, shutters that went all the way down, whereas the rest you see will have gaps between them. But those were so that the ladies could be behind them and look out. You know, there is a story about the um, uh, the history of these, not uh, clear whether this is true or not, uh, they are called louvers also. Yes. Apparently, Louis the Fourteenth he had these installed so that he could spy on uh, women bathing. <laughs> so this is, ah. you know, this is fun. Ent story. Enterprising, <laughs> enterprising of him. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so well... This is my home and I love the place. Just wonderful. I mean, these shutters are just amazing. So you don't have the problem of termites there because I wanted to get shutters here and I can't do it because of termites. You don't have this problem there? Well, teak wood is really hard and mostly if you use Burma teak, then uh, termites don't really get to it. So these shutters are made of a teak? Burma teak, yeah. Oh, okay. From from old, I, so I bought the uh, the door frames from old buildings, and I took the door frames, uh, sliced them, and and made the louver shutters out of it. I see. I see. In fact, in one of the videos, there was a French friend of mine, Christophe, who was talking about talking about the place. He helped me get the first uh, first one right, and then uh, then we did the rest. Now the uh, previous owner. Have they visited the place and the current uh, status and how do they feel about this? Well, uh, some of them have visited and they love it. And the, the oldest surviving member who is no more was actually on that uh, YouTube video that we ran where he said, thank you for restoring my home. He said that in Bengali. Yeah. Yes. He says you. this was a Rajbadi and I never thought it would remain one, but it is one again. Very wonderful. Very wonderful. Thank you. My pleasure. This was such a fantastic treat. Um, so and, really and to Naomi or anyone else who is from Calcutta or wants to visit, uh, more than happy to have you over the Rajbari Bawali and it, it will be our 